At the end of Genesis chapter 30, Jacob was using this very strange method for breeding and raising livestock. He would take these sticks or these rods and cut white stripes into them and place them before the sheep and the goats while they were feeding. And for some reason, this motivated the animals to breed and to reproduce. These animals were all of Uncle Laban's livestock. And Laban had agreed that Jacob's wages, or his earnings, would be the speckled and the spotted goats and all of the black sheep. Then all the white sheep and the plain-colored goats, well, they belonged to Laban. And I believe that Laban agreed to these wages for Jacob because there were hardly any speckled or spotted goats or hardly any black sheep to begin with. But God had blessed Jacob, and God increased Jacob's wages in abundance. Our last chapter, chapter 30, ends with verse 43, which reads that Jacob increased exceedingly and had much livestock and maid servants and men servants and camels and donkeys. And we pick it up here in Genesis chapter 31, starting in verse 1. And he heard the words of Laban's sons, saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's, and of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this glory. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not toward him as before. And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy father's, and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. Now, Jacob hadn't stolen anything from Laban. Jacob had originally agreed to work for Laban for seven years, but that was only for the hand of his daughter, Rachel. After that, Jacob would have gladly taken his bride, Rachel, and left, and gone back to the land of Canaan. But Laban tricked Jacob into another seven years for both of his daughters, both Rachel and Leah. And then after those seven years were up, Laban pleaded with Jacob to stay because Laban's livestock increased greatly after Jacob had come to work for him. The blessing of God was upon Jacob's life, and Laban was blessed because of Jacob's blessing also. So for Laban's sons to accuse Jacob of any wrongdoing, this is a very short-sighted accusation. I'm sure that Laban's flocks were still growing themselves. They had plenty of livestock also. It's just that Jacob had much more. And what would have been smiles and cooperation with one another at times before was now turning quickly into scowls and complaints against Jacob. You know, I've worked at several different jobs in my life. Like they say, jack of all trades and master of none. That's, that's me. I've had a lot of different jobs which means that I've had more than a dozen different bosses also. And without boasting, I believe that I've always had a good work ethic. So I don't really need a boss who's a, a driver or a fault finder to get me motivated. And some of my bosses over the years have been great. One job that I had when I was about 24 years old, I was a mason's tender. It's like the assistant to the bricklayer. As far as being a physically demanding job, I don't think that I've ever worked harder in my entire life. We would dig ditch with shovels and mix mortar, oftentimes by hand. We'd build scaffolding and stock block so that we could construct these cement buildings, these cement block buildings. It was a tough job. But I remember my boss on that job, his name was Chris. And he would act like a cheerleader to the whole crew. <laughs> and 
And Chris just loved everything that I did. And I never worked for anyone harder than I did for Chris as a Mason's tender. Chris was a great boss. And I've always had a hard time working for a boss like Laban. I've had a few of them also. The boss that's always threatened by your ideas and always trying to find something wrong with you so they can keep you from moving up in the ranks or from succeeding because they feel threatened by you. Those bosses don't make the workplace very enjoyable. Laban was a terrible boss like this. He was mad because Jacob did a great job and Jacob was successful. And even though Jacob was his own nephew and his own son-in-law, Laban only saw Jacob as a slave. I think it's sad when the owners of companies don't see the workplace as a fair trade. Usually, it is the company that's getting the better side of the bargain. But when the companies could care less if a man is able to support his family in fair trade, then many companies like that have bosses that just drive the people to the ground for all they're worth, and they scrimp and they cut every benefit they possibly can just so the upper management can have even more while the workers get less and less. Not every company is like this, but sadly, many are. And in free trade, there's something that the employee can always do to fix this. They can quit. (laughs) If you're working for a tyrant, then you're not his slave, and you can always quit and find another job. And I think that Jacob was blessed with enough livestock at this point that he was ready to go into business for himself. And he's getting enough scowls and complaints to give him the motivation to just move on. And where it seems like the voice of the Lord had been silent this whole time, Jacob had been under Laban's house. In verse 3, the Lord speaks to Jacob and tells him to move on from there, return to the land of Canaan, and I will be with you. Verse 4, And Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field unto his flock, and said unto them, I see your father's countenance, that it is not toward me as before, but the God of my father hath been with me. And you know that with all my power I have served your father. And your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God suffered him not to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckled shall be thy wages, then all the cattle bear speckled. And if he said thus, the ring straked shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring straked, or striped. Thus God hath taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. And it came to pass at the time that the cattle conceived that I lifted up mine eyes and saw in a dream and behold the rams which leaped upon the cattle were ring straked, speckled, and grizzled. And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream saying, Jacob, and I said, Here am I. And he said, Lift up now thine eyes and see. All the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring straked, speckled, and grizzled. For I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and thou vowest a vow unto me. Now arise, get thee out from this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. And Rachel and Leah answered and said unto him, Is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not counted of him strangers? For he hath sold us, and hath quite devoured also our money. For all the riches which God hath taken from our father, that is ours, and our children's. Now then, whatsoever God hath said unto thee, do. Now, Jacob calls a family meeting before he makes any major decisions in his life. After all, this will affect them also. But he doesn't call the boys. None of his 11 sons 
were any older than about 13 years old. And he doesn't ask the servants neither. He doesn't want any of them running off to Laban and telling him anything before he has a chance to think here. In fact, Jacob takes only Rachel and Leah and brings just the two of them out to the field with the flocks so that no one could overhear their conversation. And I like what he does. He reasons with his wives. He doesn't demand them. He's not a tyrant. Jacob is not like Laban. Jacob may be a rascal, but he's a godly man at heart. And he reasons with these two wives of his as to how their father has treated him the whole time he's been there serving Laban. The first 14 years, Jacob was serving only for Rachel and Leah. That was his wages. The girls were his wages. But during the last six years, Jacob's wages have been cattle or livestock. I think we, we think of cattle as being cows, but it was sheep and goats that Jacob was working for now. And Laban changed his wages ten times in six years. That means that he changed his wages every six months. Laban was constantly trying to shortchange Jacob. Now, I don't think of Jacob's wives as being very spiritual women. It wasn't their character that was lacking here. It was their knowledge. They grew up under the roof of that swindler Laban, and Laban wasn't a godly man. So Rachel and Leah didn't know much about the Lord Jehovah. But they do seem like they were pretty good wives because they support Jacob. Jacob tells them that Jehovah has been speaking to me about this crooked mess that I'm in with your father, and I have some ideas on what to do. And they said, do it. Whatever, whatever God has spoken to you, we're on your side. We support you, Jacob. Which is nice to see, because in the last chapter, where they're all fighting over bearing sons, it seems like they might not ever have any harmony in their home. <laughs> not at all. But these ladies say, we can't trust our father anymore. We see what he's doing to you, Jacob, and we know that God is with you. So we will follow you wherever you go. If you guys were here for our family conference, then you'll remember that in Anna's testimony, she had said that she told me to leave her alone for a couple of weeks when we were dating so she could pray and seek the Lord to see if God wanted me to marry her or not. And I don't think she mentioned this in her testimony, what she told me after her week or so were up. I don't remember exactly how long it took her. But I remember asking her, well, what do you think? Do you want to marry me? <laughs> and this is what she said. The Lord told me that I'm to follow you wherever you go. And I said, yes, <laughs> I love it. Now I really want to marry you. <laughs> I should remind her of that often. <laughs> the Lord said, do you remember? But the point is, is that Jacob's wives were with him. They were ready to follow his lead. Whatever the Lord Jehovah hath put on your heart, we will follow. Verse 17, Then Jacob rose up and set his sons and his wives upon camels. And he carried away all his cattle and all his goods which he had gotten, the cattle of his getting which he had gotten in Padan Aram, for to go to Isaac his father in the land of Canaan. And Laban went to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole the images that were her father's. And Jacob stole away unawares to Laban the Syrian, and that he told him not that he fled. So Jacob had waited for the opportune time when Laban was shearing sheep. And Jacob packed up all his tents and everything that he had and headed out 
toward Canaan. Now, depending on how many sheep Laban had, the shearing could take a few days or a few weeks if he had a lot of sheep. And I'm sure that Laban had his favorite place to go to shear the sheep, which may have been a day's journey away from his own tents. So Laban was gone, and Jacob heads out in the other direction. But before they got going, Rachel pulls a fast one on her father Laban and steals his gods from his tent and packs them up in her belongings. His gods must have been little clay statues like the Virgin Mary or the little Buddha statues that people still have today. They could have been bronze or another precious metal, but they were probably clay. Now, this is the first mention in the Bible of any man having false gods. Remember, Genesis is a book of origins. It mentions many things for the first time. And this is the first time idols are mentioned. These idols are translated as the word images. In verse 19, the Hebrew word is the word teraphim which is defined as the guardians and givers of a comfortable life. In several places in the Old Testament, it actually uses the word teraphim instead of idols or images, mostly in the book of Judges when Israel was steeped in idolatry. These images that Laban had were believed to be the Baals of Mesopotamia. And the title Baal is the same as the title God, but with a little g. Baals means God. There would be the Baal of the oil press to ensure that Laban's vats were full of oil. Then there was the Baal of the oil vat to ensure the oil in the wine would remain sweet and good. Then there would be the Baal of the highway for travel of the beehive for honey, of the barley and the wheat for the abundance of food, and the bale of livestock, and so on and so on. And I think you get the picture that the doctrine of health and wealth is wrapped up in these images. These are the bales of prosperity, or the gods of your best life now. This would be further proof that Laban's heart was filled with covetousness and idolatry. I'm not sure exactly why Rebecca had stolen these images from her father, but perhaps she was also inclined to rely upon these false gods herself. For whatever reason, she packed these little clay images up without Jacob being aware of it. And they all took off together for the land of Canaan. Jacob longed for the city of his God, which would have been Bethel, where Jehovah had met him at the first. Verse 21, So he fled with all that he had and rose up and passed over the river, I'm sure it was the Euphrates River, and set his face toward the Mount Gilead, which is still about 20 miles east of the Sea of Galilee. And it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob was fled. And he took his brethren with him and pursued after him seven days' journey. And they overtook him in the Mount Gilead. And God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. So here we have all the men of Laban. I'm sure they're all girded with the sword surrounding this little band of Jacob and his wives and his servants and their tents. And if Jacob could have done anything to get himself out of this mess, I'm sure he would have. You know, we have a tendency to think that God will only work with my faith and my faithfulness. God will only help me if I'm trusting him enough in the circumstances. 
Now, I don't believe that Jacob was doing anything wrong here, but the point I'm making is that God is watching out for us in ways that we don't even realize. Jacob may have thought, uh, this could be it. Maybe Laban and his band of men were going to kill him and take back all the livestock and his daughters and everything that he had. And I imagine that Jacob is wondering what in the world he's going to do to try to stop Laban. But in this story, Jacob doesn't have to do anything. God terrifies Laban in his sleep. God gives Laban a stern warning in his dreams that he's not even to say anything to Jacob, good or bad. You're not to even speak with him, Laban. Our God is a God of deliverance. He rescues us when we are too weak to save ourselves. He pities those who have no strength, and he helps those who are utterly helpless. In Psalm chapter 30, verses 1 through 3, it reads, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Listen, God delights to work through our obedience. But God will also rescue us when we have no strength. He can terrify our enemies in their dreams, in visions of their head, apart from anything that we have to say or anything that we might do. I love that God terrified Laban in a dream. And Jacob had nothing to do with it. Jacob was hidden in the fortress of the Lord without even knowing it. Verse 25. Then Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mount. And Laban, with his brethren, pitched in the mount of Gilead. So Jacob had pitched his tents in the mount, and Laban had also pitched his tents in the mount. And it seems that in the morning, Laban came to Jacob with his men behind him to state his case to Jacob. Verse 26, And Laban said to Jacob, What hast thou done, that thou hast stolen away unawares to me, and carried away my daughters as captives, taken with the sword? Wherefore didst thou flee away secretly and steal away from me and didst not tell me that I might have sent thee away with mirth and with songs, with tabret and with harp and hast not suffered me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Thou hast now done foolishly in so doing. It is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. But the God of your father spake unto me yesternight, saying, Take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. And now, though thou wouldest needs be gone, because thou sore longest after thy father's house, yet wherefore hast thou stolen my gods? <laughs> in the New International Version, in verse 30, it reads, Now you have gone off because you long to return to your father's household. But why did you steal my gods? <laughs> In this confrontation, Laban is pretty hot. He accuses Jacob of wrongdoing, but since he doesn't have any real concrete evidence, he simply implies that Jacob's done foolishly in leaving. This was actually the smartest thing that Jacob could have done is to leave in the way that he did. But Laban was pretty upset over the whole thing. In verse 26, he said, You took my daughters as a thief would take the women as captives with the sword. Which is not true. They were willing to get away from their father and to be with Jacob. 
In verse 27, he says that Jacob's secret departure is viewed as stealing from Laban, which is not true also. Laban was the only one who kept shortchanging Jacob the whole time that he worked for him. And in verse 28, he says that Jacob didn't even allow Laban to kiss his daughters and his grandchildren goodbye, which I'm sure Jacob would have done if he felt that he could have trusted Laban. But he didn't trust him at all. And for all of this, Laban would have killed Jacob. He says it in verse 29 where he says, Is it not in my power to do thee hurt? Which means I would have hurt you badly, but your God had intervened on your behalf, Jacob. Laban doesn't have much here on Jacob at all. These accusations are pretty weak since he's not allowed to hurt him. All that he can do is slander Jacob and compare Jacob to himself. In verse 27, Laban says that I would have sent you away with mirth, that means with joy, with song, and with tabret, and with harp. I would have given you a big farewell party if I could have, but you had to act like a criminal and run away secretly. Now, you know that Laban didn't have any kind of party planned for Jacob ever. <laughs> if Jacob had ever told Laban that he was planning on leaving, he would have surrounded him back in Padan Aram and taken all of Jacob's belongings by force, and probably his daughters also. Jacob was very wise to get out like he did. I'm sure Laban is frustrated he knows that he has nothing on Jacob that would hold up in a court of law. So all he has to say then is, on top of all this, Jacob, why did you have to steal my gods? <laughs> I, I like Philip's commentary on this portion of Scripture. It reads that Laban's gods were mighty gods that can be stolen. Gods that can be packed up like old pots and pans and stuffed into a bag. Gods that can be bounced and jostled over 300 miles without a word or a whimper. Gods that are supposed to be able to influence wind and weather, but do not even have the voice to cry out to Laban, Here we are, Laban. Save us from the saddlebags. It's funny that Laban needs to fight for his stolen gods since he doesn't know where they're at. And you know that statues never answer anyone. If anyone has any kind of communication through false religions, then it's just doctrines of demons. And that's it. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5, it reads, I am the Lord. And there is none else. There is no God besides me. Laban had quite a few accusations against Jacob. In verse 31, And Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid. That's why I ran off secretly. For I said, Peradventure, thou wouldest take by force thy daughters from me. With whomsoever thou findest thy gods, let him not live. And before our brethren, discern thou what is thine with me, and take it to thee. For Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen them. So Jacob says, kill the person who has stolen your gods. Obviously, he has no idea that Rachel had taken them. And Laban went into Jacob's tent, and into Leah's tent, and into the two maidservants' tent, but he found them not. Then he went out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the images and put them in the camel's furniture or in the saddlebags on one of the camels. And having them in the tent, she sat upon them. And Laban searched all the tent, but found them not. And she said unto her father, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise up before thee. For the custom of women 
is upon me. And he searched, but found not the images. So Rachel must have pulled her dress over the top of these little clay idols, these statues. They must not have been very big. But when Laban came into her, into her tent, she said, You'll have to pardon me, my lord, but I cannot rise to greet you since I'm in a little bit of discomfort with my monthly cycle. Now, I had mentioned that Rachel might have trusted also in these idols, but both her and Leah did show an ounce of faith in Jehovah at the beginning of this chapter when they said, whatever God has told you, Jacob, do it. So with that, there may have been another motive for her stealing Laban's gods. The household images in these days belong to the head of the family, the head of the house. If Jacob had gotten the possession of these gods, then he could claim the right to Laban's inheritance if he wanted to. Since he had the gods, then he could take the possessions of all that Laban had when Laban died. And even Laban's own sons would have had to give them to Jacob. So maybe Rachel was just securing Jacob's right to his own belongings by taking Laban's gods. It's a possibility. But as far as Jacob knew, he didn't have them. And so he saw this accusation as another insult by Laban. In verse 36, it reads, And Jacob was wroth, or he was angry, and he chode with Laban, or he contended with him. It seems like Jacob has become very bold behind the shield of Jehovah. And Jacob answered and said unto Laban, What is my trespass? And what is my sin that thou hast so hotly pursued after me? Whereas thou hast searched all my stuff, what hast thou found of all thy household stuff? Set it here before my brethren and thy brethren, that they may judge between us both. This twenty years that I have been with thee, thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast their young, or they never miscarried. And the rams of thy flock have I not eaten, which means I never stolen anything from you in all of the twenty years that I worked for you. That which was torn of beasts I brought not unto thee. I bear the loss of it. Of my hand didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Which means that if a sheep or a goat was killed by wild beasts, you still required the same count from me, and so I took the loss out of my own flocks for your livestock. If it was stolen, I had to repay it. See, Laban was a terrible boss. <laughs> and it was only because his heart wasn't right with the Lord. Jacob says he broke his back for Laban, and Laban couldn't have found a better worker than Jacob. And he knew it. In verse 40, it reads, Thus I was in the day the drought consumed me and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from mine eyes, which means I worked day and night without vacation and without rest. And I know you would have never played the harp at my departure. You probably wouldn't even have had any songs at my funeral, you snake. <laughs> Jacob was really letting him have it here. Verse 41, Thus have I been twenty years in thy house. I served thee fourteen years for thy two daughters and six years for thy cattle. And thou hast changed my wages ten times. But who's counting? <laughs> he must have said it at least three times. I'm sure glad that Jacob's not upset over this whole matter. <laughs> He says in verse 42, Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely thou hast sent me away now empty. God hath seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked thee yesternight. 
And Laban answered and said unto Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and these cattle are my cattle, and all that thou seest is mine. And what can I do this day unto these my daughters, or unto their children which they have borne? Now therefore come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, and they did eat there upon the heap. And Laban called it Jeger Sahadutha, but Jacob called it Galit. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Therefore the name of it is called Galid and Mizpah. For he said, The Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent one from another. If thou afflict my daughters, or if thou take other wives beside my daughters, no man is with us. See, God is witness between me and thee. Now, I can imagine that the best relationship that Jacob had ever had with Laban was during the first seven years while Jacob was working for the hand of Rachel. Remember, those seven years seemed like just a few days to Jacob since he was so in love with Rachel. During that time, Laban had this man doing whatever he commanded him without a fuss. And I'm sure he worked him to death right off the bat. And then after Laban had deceived Jacob on his wedding night and slipped Leah into the tent rather than the expected bride, Rachel, I think that the relationship between Jacob and Laban must have gone downhill from there. But you have to remember that Laban had never had such an increase in his livestock before Jacob had come to work for him. He could have been very generous with Jacob, and his increase would have been blessed. He said it himself at the end of the 14 years, back in chapter 30, verse 27, which reads, And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, stay with me and work for me. For I have learned by experience that Jehovah hath blessed me for thy sake. You know, I, I read one commentary that Jacob's hostility towards Laban at the end of this chapter probably ruined his witness with Laban. That Laban may have been saved if Jacob would have been a little kinder or more reasonable in Mount Gilead. And as much as I respect this commentator, I couldn't disagree more with him on this statement. If Jacob was a witness to Laban, it wasn't in Mount Gilead alone. Laban had 20 years to make up his mind whether he would serve the God of Jacob or serve his own gods of earthly success. Laban's rage over the missing teraphim or his clay idols shows all the generations of Christians who have ever had the privilege of reading this story right where Laban's heart had been all along. He was without one ounce of repentance in the full view of the God of mercy and the God of blessing. If Laban died and went to hell, it certainly wasn't Jacob's fault one bit. Laban was a grown man and he was responsible for his own choices. What Laban did do was that he practically worked Jacob to death. But God had continued to raise Jacob from the dead over and over again. Every time God had blessed Jacob with another striped goat or another black sheep, Laban hated him for being the object of such love. Thus is the man who hates God 
the God of mercy and blessing. I don't get it. Honestly, I don't get it. He hates the God of love and wishes only slavery and destruction on the objects of God's love. Just as much as Satan hates Jesus for every spotted goat and every black sheep that enters into his fold. Jesus is filled with love for sinners. But Satan has nothing but hatred and bondage planned for those whom Christ died for. Changing Jacob's wages ten times didn't thwart the blessing of God. It only hardened the heart of Laban even more. You cannot condemn those who are in Christ. If God said that Jacob was blessed, then there was nothing that Laban could say or do to change that. And boy, did he try. You know, I'm sure that their relationship had grown into a very tense and very hostile situation. As Laban became more and more upset over losing even one goat to Jacob. Because Laban was a very greedy man. In verse 43, he says that these daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and these cattle are my cattle, and all that thou seest is mine. Actually, none of it was his. Nothing. Everything legally belonged to Jacob. He had earned it, but ultimately God had given it to him. So he didn't steal anything from Laban. And Laban searched all his stuff and found nothing of his at all. <laughs> so all Laban could do now was get steamed and make this covenant between the two of them. Now, this covenant that Laban makes with Jacob is nothing more than a bitter rant. But it's a two-way agreement. He said, let's build a monument between us for a sign against one another. And so all of Jacob's men and probably some of Laban's men piled these rocks up into a pillar. I bet it was as big as they could make it <laughs> before they wore themselves out. Anger is a motivator, you know. I don't know if it's a good motivator, but it sure planted a big pillar between Jacob and Laban. On Laban's end, I believe his anger was over the past. All the evil you did me, Jacob, lies in this here pile of rocks. It's a testimony against you for stealing all my stuff. And on Jacob's end, on Jacob's end, I believe that this is a delight over his future. All the evil that you did me, Laban, will never come my way again. Since this pillar represents my past trials under your roof, and I don't need to come this way again or worry that you're going to come after me any time in the future also. I guess this was a pillar of past and future for both men. The future that Jacob had in mind was to get on now with his life without Laban. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but the future that Laban had in mind was another bitter accusation against Jacob. In verses 49 and 50, Laban says, The Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent one from another. If thou shalt afflict my daughters, or if thou shalt take other wives besides my daughters, no man is with us. But see, God is witness between me and thee. Now, I say this is another bitter accusation because, for one, Jacob had never afflicted Laban's daughters ever before. He was pretty good to these two ladies. So Laban was just being bitter. And the other thing that he said was that Jacob wasn't to take any wives besides the two women also. 
Well, Jacob had never wanted but the one wife in the first place. It was Laban's doing that Jacob even had two wives and two concubines. Jacob only wanted Rachel. I think that Laban would have rather piled those rocks upon Jacob for a grave than to make this agreement with him. Now, in verse 47 through 49, Laban called the pillar of stones Jegar Saha Dutha. Jegar Saha Dutha. But Jacob called it Galid. And I like Jacob's word better. It's easier to pronounce. And Laban's word is Aramaic. And Jacob's word is Hebrew. It's a Hebrew word. And they both mean the same thing, which is a heap of witness. That's what it means. A heap of witness. Or you could say, for the record. <laughs> this mound was a legal contract between these two to keep each other out of the other one's hair. It's sort of like a restraining order. This means that both of these men thinks the other one is the biggest rascal they've ever met in their life. And they never want to see each other ever again. And if there's ever a time you think about coming my way, remember this pile of stones and just stay back in your own land. Deal? <laughs> Deal. In verse 49, this pile of stones became well known by the name of Mizpah, which means a watchtower. And a watchtower is usually the structure on the corner of the castle wall. It's the lookout tower to spot the enemies from afar off. Even Laban said that this is where the Lord Jehovah keeps a watch between you and me. And this is not a, this is not a friendly gesture at all. This was definitely a bitter ending to a bitter relationship. Verse 51, And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold this pillar, which I have cast between me and thee. This heap be witness, and this pillar be witness, that I will not pass over this heap unto thee, and that thou shalt not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, which was both of their grandfathers, the God of their father judge between us, which means that they're going back to the original God who started all of this, the God of the father of Nahor and Abraham. And that's who's sealing this deal. And Jacob swear by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered sacrifice upon the mount and called his brethren to eat bread. And they did eat bread and tarried all night in the mount. Now, if Laban had sat in his tent all that evening sulking and stewing, then Jacob had a celebration and offered sacrifice and broke bread with all his brethren on the mount, which is yet another picture of two men who can't dwell together very well. One is bitter and one is rejoicing. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? It was much more than a clash of personalities that divided these men. One was a true believer, and the other was a pagan idolater. One was a great man of faith in human history, and the other was an unrighteous infidel who dwelt in darkness. The Lord is that dividing sword between the two that comes between believer and unbeliever. And we shouldn't try to fix it through compromise. I believe that we need to stand our ground in the Lord. That's to stand in faith, to stand in love, to stand in the Spirit, but we should stand firm 
in the Lord. And let them, let the unbelievers, come across that dividing line when they come to Christ. And let us just stay as close to the promised land as we possibly can. In verse 55, it reads, And early in the morning Laban rose up and kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them. And Laban departed and returned unto his place. So we end the story of Laban, just like Ishmael and the other men who walk after the flesh. The story doesn't follow them. The story didn't follow Ishmael. It's not going to follow Esau for very long, and it doesn't follow Laban. But it does follow the line of Christ. And we'll pick it up next week, Lord willing, more on the life of the man who is blessed of God, and that's Jacob.